Howdy everyone, this is Nicole Zagman with Parkside Farm. So I wanted to share an educational video with you about goat kidding, specifically pygmy goat kidding. And I wanted to share with you the experience of our recent kidding that happened on April 6, 2024. And this video is gonna talk a little bit about the importance of having a trusted goat mentor or several goat mentors because I actually relied on one of mine for this kidding process. So to illustrate exactly what took place, what happened, I am going to use my little cute little Samson plushie um, and I've got a little plastic bag here so we can actually see what's going on inside of the, the birth canal. So just for a little bit of back history and information, Stella is a three-year-old registered pygmy goat. This was her first freshening, which means this was her first pregnancy, first kidding. I had tried to breed her earlier and she just didn't want to take. I think in total, I put her with my two different books a total of six different times. I wasn't able to get her to take the first four times. Then it just got too late in the year and the season for my liking. And so I thought, well, I'll try the following fall, which was last fall, um, 2023. So I spent summer 2023 really upping her mineral intake and really working on her nutrition. And then in September, I put her back in with my buck, Zorro. I know he has proven. Um, I had a doe pregnant to him last year. Um, and anyway, so I knew that he was working. I've done a collection on him. I knew he wasn't the issue. And I also knew Zorro, my buck, who is the daddy of Samson and Samuel, also um, was uh, <laughs> fertile, I guess is the word I'm looking for, because he had sired um, two previous kids. So... The first um, rebreed with Zeus did not take. The second one with Zorro, however, did work, finally. I did actually lay hands on her and pray over her, so I'd like to think that God had something to do with this because I just was at my wit's end. But she finally took, and I was so excited when we got to see those babies on the first ultrasound 30 days after that breeding. So with her being a first time freshener, I was watching her like a hawk. Um, she, I wasn't sure when she was going to kid. Being a first time freshener, it's always up in the air. We did know that she had twins coming. And um, so anyway, her day 145 for, based upon my hand breeding, I like to hand breed all my goats, which means that I know exactly when they've been bred to which buck. Um, I literally do have to hold the does and the female so that the bucks can do their thing, but it's just, for me, a much better way to breed. I know exactly what their due date's going to be. I know if they got bred. And so I did end up leaving Stella an extra day. Um, I think I had her in with Zorro four days instead of two or three, which usually, you know, first, first uh, attempt usually works. Um, so I did leave her in a little extra long. Um, she did show some early signs of labor on day 144. Um, I was kind of up all night with her, <laughs> checking on her. And of course, by morning, she was back to normal. Uh, she, the only thing that was really off with her that day of 144 was she was very particularly quiet. She was not calling to be out with the rest of the goats like she normally was. And then, um, so on day 145, um, she was also quiet. She was ravenous, um, like the 24 hours before she kidded. She just was trying to, she had the munchies. She was eating everything in sight, wanted to eat, eat, eat. Um, and one of the key ways I can tell if a doe is going to kid, it's not always 100% foolproof, but you watch for their udder to bag up and get really full and really tight. Hers had continued to do that um, with her being a first time mom. It wasn't overly huge. So that wasn't probably the most accurate um, uh, giveaway for her. Her personality changed um, and then by seven o'clock on Saturday night, I kept, I was working outside all day, I kept checking on her every couple hours. She had a little glob of what we call goo on her rear end. And that to me is a sign of labor starting within the next couple hours. Sometimes they can take up to 12 hours, but for me with first time fresheners in my history, that usually means that they'll have them within the next couple hours. So I quick got her out of the pen that she was in, 
and I put her in the kidding pen that I wanted her to be in and um, she started having contractions shortly after that but she was not typical like a lot of my other kiddings. I couldn't really tell for sure if she was having contractions because every time I think she felt a twinge of discomfort, she'd hop right up on all four feet, but then she'd lay immediately back down again. And I started timing those intervals and they were getting shorter and shorter. So I was pretty sure that we were moving in the right direction. Um, you'll normally see, and this is what I saw with her, more goo um, as she's losing that first stage of, um, it's typically called mucus plug, which goes can also lose them earlier weeks leading up to labor, but with first time fresheners, um, my experience is that they don't normally lose it until a few hours or when you're imminently getting ready <laughs> to have baby. So with her getting up and down, um, I was like, I'm not leaving, um, knowing my last first time freshener um, a year ago in April. Once I saw that goo and uh, determined, okay, I think we're we're progressing. She had she was actively pushing um, within a couple hours, so I knew that was probably going to be the time frame for me. Um, but Stella was a little different. She pawed the ground just a little bit. She really didn't make a lot of fuss. She she was a little loud just a couple times, and then all of a sudden, she just laid down and just started just a couple really hard pushes and I'm like, okay. Um, and another sign that I can tell if they're getting ready to get into that active labor where they're actively pushing, when they lay down, they will kind of strain and kick that one of their back legs out. They'll push against the ground with those back legs and that's what she was doing, but she'd get up immediately. So anyway, so we're, I think, let's see, she had both babies just a few minutes before 11 p.m. So that timeline from 7 to 11 p.m., not very long, but she lays down and all of a sudden she starts pushing really hard. And I had already asked my husband to go get me um, a headlamp and a better light source because we needed to replace the light bulbs up above and I needed better light. And so as soon as I sent him to do that, of course she lays down and starts pushing and I'm like, shoot, <laughs> like I could have used the extra hand. And so when he gets back, she had already pushed out, um, and I was a little unprepared for this, she pushed out a little intact water sack and it hadn't burst yet. Um, so I was like, okay, that's out. Um, and then I thought, okay, maybe the next water sack that was coming shortly after that would have baby in it. And that one didn't either. And I was like, okay, it had been a few, it's been over a decade, I think, dating myself since I'd had a herd that did not have kidding complications because my previous three kiddings all resulted in emergency C-sections. So I never got to this stage with the other three where I was having multiple water sacks come out and I was like, okay, is this normal? And something seemed a little discolored. Every kidding is different. Every doe is different. So after that second water sack came out, um, she kind of rested for just a little bit. And then I saw, I was like, baby has to be coming soon. So the first thing I see after she's pushed those two water bu water bubbles or water sacks out, um, I see just the tip of the tongue of baby coming out the canal and um, just the very tip of the nose, kind of like this. Like I couldn't even see the whole mouth. It was just the tongue and the nose. And she was pushing and she was pushing and pushing hard and that baby was not budging. And I think just before that, I had got my husband to call up my friend Shannon. Shout out to you, Shannon. Thank you so much for helping me and talking me through because I had everything <laughs> going through my mind of the past uh, not so great experiences. And I thought, oh my gosh, I do not want to have this baby get stuck in here. And she told me to, I was already gloved up and had already be, had lube on my hands, but Stella was um, trying to stand up while she was trying to get this baby out. And here I am trying to get behind her and get positioned behind her to really see what's going on. And the thing that concerned me was that I didn't want, because um, her nostrils were barely out, outside of the goat, outside of Stella, um, that water sack hadn't quite 
the membrane hadn't broken yet and I didn't want it to because I didn't want her to get sucked back in and her to potentially suffocate. So um, I had a glove on. I just used one finger and Shannon was very good. She just said, keep trying to get in and around uh, the baby's head. And at first glance, it probably took me 15 minutes and I had called had Ken call our vet and um, they were already on the way but in the meantime I had to work to get this baby out so when I got finger in there's like no room and it's like this I cannot get my finger like past the baby's tip of the nose and I'm like oh my gosh this is terrible I'm trying to remain calm and Shannon just kept saying keep trying keep trying keep trying well there was a membrane um, something that was preventing my finger to go in and I do remember saying to you Shannon I feel like I'm hitting a wall and I just could not get my finger to budge around this baby's face and the tongue was turning a little purple and I was like oh my goodness this is not going well and finally after I just kept working my my finger around baby's nose just kept going at it I finally was able to get because that was the other thing, I was looking for a foot. So typical, like, A plus presentation, you want to see face coming first down like this, and then little foot or both feet tucked in under the chin. So Shannon said, you need to see if you can feel a foot underneath that chin, but I couldn't even get my finger past her nose. But finally, I was able to get uh, my finger in underneath that membrane that was like keeping my finger out. And here I'm afraid like I'm going to poke her eye or whatever, but I was really having a hard time trying to get my finger in past the back of her head to grab the back of her head to try to get this baby out. So I went to plan B. Shannon was very good at explaining to me I needed to try to find that foot. So as um, I'm just going to take my scissors as I worked on her and that canal opened up a little bit more I was able to get my finger in I moved, kept moving it around and I was like oh yes I found uh, the little foot down here just under her chin I was so thrilled that there was a foot there and that they weren't both tucked back behind her shoulders um, so I was like yippee skippy um, so what I ended up doing because I was struggling to get my hand my, uh, my hand wasn't even in there, my finger behind her head, I actually was able to, there's dew, little dew claws on the back of their feet, back behind their hooves, so I was able to get my little pointer finger underneath that dew claw, and I was able to gently pull just a little bit. Meanwhile, I still had to make this, the opening a little bit bigger, so I'm actually going to open it a little bit bigger. And Stella still is trying to get up, get down, get up, get down. Thankfully, God, like, really gave me a peace. I had been praying and playing worship music ahead of this whole experience and my sister-in-law Lisa had come and visited with the kids as she had started labor and I said Lisa would you please just come in and pray over us that this would just go smoothly that if there is any issues that I would have like the wisdom the ability to figure things out and to make whatever I need to do happen. So um, as I worked on her was able to get my finger underneath that little leg and then I was able to also kind of put pressure on top of the baby's nose and by this time I had been able to work her nose out so it was sticking out a little bit more. Um, the sack had broken at that point but I was um, happy that her nose was out and, and she was actually moving her mouth around at that time um, and before that she wasn't so I was like gosh I still I hope the baby is alive. Um, I was able to take my little suction bulb and I suctioned some of that mucus out of her nose so that her airways were clear even when I was still trying to get the baby out. Um, so worked on her. I actually ended up finally Shannon's still talking to me. Everything is very slippery, by the way. And now, now baby is going back in. This illustration is uh, not working as well as I had hoped. Everything is slippery. I'm covered in blood and goo, all that fun stuff. So I actually, on, on the very home stretch, last move I made, I've got my finger under the dew claw. Her 
kind of over the baby's head. I grabbed Stella's tail and just pulled up on her tail because I needed to get as much room as possible to get this baby out because now time has really been ticking. I kind of said the vet is has pulled into the driveway. Just as I lifted the tail, I pulled her head, kept pulling baby, and let's see if I can pull baby out. And then her head finally popped out of the birth canal and and whoop, she came the rest of her came right up <laughs> so and i was like oh my gosh thank god um baby was okay pulled her out she was breathing she was moving um quickly took my syringe and continued in her mouth and in her nostrils the sucking out that um, mucus making sure she didn't aspirate and breathe any of that in rubbed her down just a little bit and set her in front of um mama and was just trying to get her cleaned off and dry in the meantime just gonna set a little baby here i just hold her <laughs> um i quick checked under the tail because i was like i want to know if it's a boy or a girl like right away and it was a girl so i was like thank god i got my girl um I was so excited so thrilled um, by that time, Dr. Carleen with South Kent Veterinary Services, love them. They've been terrific. They have wonderful um, emergency after hours care, and that's what we needed again in this situation. She had already hopped in the pen, had her arm in Stella, and very quickly she found a leg and just gently pulled and the baby boy came right out. I think she was surprised how easily he came out just grabbing one leg. So, um, yeah, both of them were born just before 11 p.m. on Saturday, April 6th, I believe. And um, they're all doing well. And I just wanted to share the birth story and um, my first successful kidding experience since restarting my herd in 2021. It was a little rocky <laughs> at the at the beginning, but we managed to work it out. And it's important to have uh, those goat mentors, those breeder friends that you can call in situations like that who can talk you through things. Um, and now I feel a lot more confident moving forward into other kiddings with um, situations like this. With the previous three C-sections, um, I felt my hands were like completely and almost figuratively tied there was nothing I could do no matter how much I tried um when you've got a goat in labor and they haven't dilated you can't get your hand in to to really do anything I had that happened um twice and then well ex sorry the first time that happened the second time um mama's pelvis was not big enough for baby to come through so I could feel the tip of the nose but Bell just wasn't big enough to get the baby through. So that was the second emergency section, C-section. And then the third one, Mama went into labor a couple days before her due date. She um, never actually moved into active pushing. And so even though we had her checked out that night, the vet said, you know, let's try to give her some more time. And I opted to do that because I really didn't want another C-section. But about... Um, that next morning I ended up taking her back in and she ended up with an emergency c-section and we had lost the little baby doe in that situation so all that to say um it, kidding is a very stressful and exciting time I would recommend um anyone who is looking to breed goats maybe you already have goats um to learn as much as much as much as you can um, listen to podcasts, talk to breeders who have been through traumatic breedings and situations, especially when where they have had to have C-sections, where they've had to go in and assist, and when um, sometimes you end up losing the babies and mom. It's a very tragic reality, but sometimes it does happen. Um, it's an unfortunate part of breeding, but it also makes the good situations like what we experienced this last weekend that much more rewarding and special so those are just some tips that I have for you if you are just getting into breeding goats um, I'll be doing more educational videos sorry this video has gone so long but I really wanted to visually illustrate and share about the kidding that we we recently had um, with the twins so hope this is helpful and I look forward to creating more educational content regarding pygmy goats. Have a great day.